love Joel Ransom, extension agronomist for cereal crop. I wish I was with you face to face in Dickinson. I'm aware of some of the challenges that you're facing this season and hope that the remainder of the year, the weather will be beneficial. As I'm approaching the end of my career, Ryan Beto has asked that I reflect back on my experiences and share some of the lessons that I've learned, uh, some lessons that may be helpful to you. My 40 years might be described as somewhat atypical for an extension agronomist in North Dakota. I hope, though, that the experiences that I've had have led to some lessons that would be useful uh, to you, even though not all of my learning has been in North Dakota setting. In fact, I started my research career working with wild rice in Minnesota. I then spent uh, three years in Mexico working on irrigated and rain-fed environments, both on farm and in research station, working with with wheat, uh, both durum and spring wheat. I then worked 13 years in Africa, where I had the chance to see the impact of of new varieties uh, on farmers that have had limited access to varieties. I also learned about the importance of maintaining soil health by uh, ensuring that organic matter goes back into the soil in addition to regular soil fertility practices. I was also disappointed to learn of the policies restricting the use of GMOs. And I think of what an impact uh, genetically modified corn would have at this point in history when the fall armyworm is having such a devastating impact on uh, corn production. And I certainly think that uh, GMOs would be safer than the current practices that are employed of spraying insecticides with limited uh, protective equipment. And finally, I concluded my international experience in Nepal where farm size was very small, the use of equipment was limited. And you can imagine you in a set setting like this that even a small rotavator would be very difficult uh, to use on farm. So it was quite a transition for me to go from Nepal to, to North Dakota, uh, where you know large equipment and chemicals allow for the use of uh, for the farming of um, much expanded areas. So what are some of the lessons that I learned? And I thought I would summarize my lessons learned uh, by uh, talking in the first person as if I had uh, somehow inherited a farm and now was going to farm based on and using some of the uh, experiences that I've had in the, in the past. So first of all, I understand the importance of using the best varieties in a farm to enhance the productivity using the practices uh, that are considered best practices. Based on that, I would do my homework in selecting new varieties. What does that mean? I would use data from multiple environments, including high and low yielding environments. I would certainly avoid varieties that are susceptible to diseases, sprouting, and low protein in wheat. Rather than go for the highest yielding in a variety in, in a research station nearest my farm, I would look at stable varieties, meaning varieties that yielded well over both in both high yielding and low yielding environments. And I think I would regularly introduce new varieties in a small way and expand their use as uh, I, from my own experience, I determined that they fit into my, uh, that they'll be useful to my farm. But secondly, I would conduct some level of on-farm testing. And, and by this, I would mean something that's easily conducted based using uh, yield monitors and the equipment that I have. Uh, topics, for example, that, I, that would lend itself to this kind of research would be including an enriched strip or an in-pour strip to see how well my fertilization program is matching the need. I, I think uh, altering seeding rate could easily be done and uh, would provide uh, valuable inf information, particularly if it is done routinely over a number of years. Uh, Pop-up fertilization, fertil fungicide use, these are also factors that could easily be uh, experimented. And I think that uh, by experimenting, I would learn much faster than just uh, relying on the outcome of my uh, regular practices on a given year. I certainly would 
have a yield monitor in my combine and I would archive those data. I did have interaction with a farmer that had, had a yield monitor for many years, but never knew how to archive the data. And I think by archiving and learning from uh, past years, uh, one can learn a lot about the fields that are being farmed. Very powerful tool for uh, advancing uh, techniques, including precision ag. And I certainly would implement some level of precision agriculture in my farm. And I'm not suggesting a, a very detailed uh, top of the line kind of precision ag program, but for example, using uh, yield data and aerial images to guide uh, the use of, of production zones within a field. I know here's an example of a, uh, of a field that we've done some research on and you can see this red would represent the low yielding parts of the field. And it turns out these are sand ridges. Year after year, those are going to be the lowest yielding parts of the field, yet they receive the same level of fertility of the rest of the field. And it just makes sense uh, to have some level of meat for, to me, to have some level of precision agriculture where I would alter the amount of uh, fertilizer that these, uh, per, these, routinely poor yielding areas are, are receiving. Now, on the other hand, you know, if you look at this part of the field where it's, it's high yielding, it's also very low in protein. This is protein map here. And again, this would uh, suggest that uh, when we're thinking of, of putting fertilizer on, it makes sense to put less here and more there. Uh, so we're gonna get more out of our, of our field. You know, I think uh, N rates is 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 one of the <clears throat> areas of precision ag that one could consider. Uh, you might also, for those of your corn farmers, consider uh, plant populations. I'm not so sure that that we have the data to support changing hybrids um, within a field, uh, but populations perhaps, and certainly nitrogen levels. And finally, I would certainly use a da available data to guide uh, input use. Uh, I think the disease prediction model is a great uh, tool that can be used to help determine whether the uh, fungicides are needed. I would not just routinely apply fungicide. I would look at both the disease, disease predict prediction model. I'd look at uh, forecast for weather and uh, do scouting in my field before um, I, I use fungicide. Um, I would also uh, extensively use research results that are available. And it might mean that, yeah, I would have to dig around a bit. Not always are the data available in an easily accessible form. But in, as an example, on helping me decide whether I should use fungicide on corn, I would use uh, data that's available both here in North Dakota and elsewhere to, to get a sense of uh, the potential benefit um, of, of fungicide. And I might just say that I think the data in, in most cases in North Dakota where we have so very little disease pressure on corn, uh, that would be a, a practice that would likely not be profitable. And I would also employ my own experience and data from previous years to help me in making some of these decisions. And I think with that, um, I know this is a short presentation. Uh, I hope that I've sparked some ideas and that might be useful as you consider your approach to farming. And as again, as I mentioned at the outset, I hope the remainder of the season is more favorable weather-wise and that, uh, that you're safe and healthy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.